Meanwhile, a major bust in Johnson, Marion and Morgan counties. Police say drugs and these dealers are now off the streets. As RTV 6's Derek Thomas reports, the flurry of police activity capped off an investigation that actually started six months ago. Police raided room 106 here at the Tierman Motel here in Franklin. They made an arrest as a result. They thoroughly searched the premises and arrested 39-year-old Charles Mons. He is charged with dealing methamphetamine, possession of a weapon by a serious violent felon, maintaining a common nuisance, and possession of a syringe. 26-year-old Brittany Burton faces those same charges except for the gun charge. Other tenants at the motel suspected criminal activity was going on in room 106. What's scary is there was young, young people going yeah. in and out of there, like high school age, and that's what's scary, so cleaning them up is the best thing that could happen. Wendell says she and her children are living here while she tries to repair her credit so she can get a regular apartment. Motel staffers say despite the arrest, the motel is respectable. We have people who actually come from Kentucky and Ohio who stay here uh, weekly. They're workers, so they trust it enough to stay here and they leave their vehicles here. So, yeah, it's a very safe place, very safe place. Some might dispute that, but there is no disputing that 28 of 43 suspects who were targeted in the sweep are under arrest, and the community is just a little bit safer. But police need the community's help in corralling the drug scourge. Say if you see something, say something, because we are very proactive in this community on taking out drug dealers and any other crime, because what you'll see oftentimes is crimes are related to drugs, our thefts, our burglaries. So if you see something, say something, we have Detectives working exclusively on, on drugs, but we have other officers and detectives working to be proactive against other crimes as well. Prosecutor Brad Cooper says the good news is that meth labs are becoming a thing of the past in Johnson County. The bad news is the meth is still a problem and most of it coming up from Mexico. In Franklin, Derek Thomas, RTV6. All right. So open, close. Balen Sloat is an acupuncturist providing services at Turning Point Center of Chittenden County. Though not one himself, he demonstrated what around 20 recovering addicts went through during a dental clinic at the center. About a year ago, we did a study here of our guests and on core morbid issues uh, besides their addiction. And it turned out that oral health was the third largest comorbid issue that they're dealing with. The, the tooth up there is a little bit thinner. The Chittenden County Opioid Alliance has partnered with Delta Dental to not only provide basic services to the recovering community, but take an in-depth look at how Suboxone, a drug used to aid in the recovery process, is affecting dental health. The drug is placed into the tongue for 30 to 60 minutes, coats the mouth, and is high in acidity. I have a special particular interest in patients on medication assisted treatment, particularly Suboxone, um, because there's not a lot of literature around it, but anecdotally we see significant side effects from the medication um, and oral health implications. Turning Point Director Gary DiCarlo says dental issues are nothing new for those who visit the center. You know, people have neglected their health in general for years while they're actively using, and now they're in recovery, and these issues become paramount to deal with. Patients are examined, then recommended where to go next to receive full care. A couple of things that are missing, though, that we really need to make some change on is um, the funding of availability, the funding availability for folks who maybe need dentures or more oral health care that typically isn't covered under Medicaid. All right, stick your tongue all the way out at me. And then... A $150,000 grant given by Delta Dental will also move forward research as to how Suboxone may be causing damage during the recovery process. We absolutely appreciate and recognize the importance of having Suboxone and other medication-assisted treatments to help somebody transition. Um, but we want to raise awareness for patients and prescribers about what we're seeing in the oral cavity. I guess that's that's it. In Burlington, Jennifer Sheehan, NBC5 News. Alarming. That is how law enforcement officials describe the record amount of drugs seized in Minnesota last year. It is everything from methamphetamine to prescription pills to heroin. Take a look at these numbers from the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. In 2016, officers seized 488 pounds of meth. That is a 484% increase from 2009 when meth seizures were at their lowest levels. 
Seizures of prescription pills, including opioids, are also up in 2016. The alarming rate at which drugs are being seized from the Twin Cities to greater Minnesota should concern every single Minnesotan. The seizure of illegal drugs like meth, heroin, and pills containing fentanyl is unprecedented. You don't know if this is really oxycodone or if it's fentanyl or if it's a mixture. Law enforcement officials say even though the number of meth labs in Minnesota dropped from 410 in 2003 to just 13 last year, the drug continues to be very accessible. Meth continues to flow into our state. Meth is primarily sourced out of the country of Mexico and makes its way into Minnesota through commercial and uh, private motor vehicles. Meth use is a problem all across the state in cities and rural areas. Faribault has seen a 208% increase in meth seizures between 2015 and 2016. So the methamphetamine is really off the charts in the state of Minnesota. We've never seen this before. The seizure of illegal pills that contain synthetic opioids like fentanyl jumped dramatically as well, four times as many in 2016 compared to 2012. Officials say most are shipped here from China. We've seen fentanyl in powder form as well as pill form and micrograms. So the, the size of a salt uh, molecule uh, can kill you uh, if it is carfentanil. Carfentanil is an elephant tranquilizer. Law enforcement officials are working with the Postal Service to try to better identify packages containing illegal drugs. The Commissioner of Public Safety says we cannot enforce our way out of this problem. She called on parents and teachers and the peers of those who take drugs to say enough is enough. Employee is among three people arrested in a drug bust in Muskegon and Muskegon Heights where police say they nabbed kilos of drugs. The charges carry a potential life sentence for two of the three indicted. Barton Dieters is back from Muskegon where he has been looking into this case tonight. Barton. Well, Brian, James Kitchen is a 51-year-old divorced father, one who says he's worked for 16 years for the Michigan Department of Corrections. Now he is the one facing time behind bars. On Sunday, Michigan State Police out of the Grand Haven and Rockford Post arrested Kitchen along with two co-defendants. They are now charged with delivery, manufacturing of cocaine or heroin and methamphetamine. Kitchen, a graduate of Muskegon Heights High School, was arrested at his home in this tidy Muskegon neighborhood, police say. He is held on a $1 million bond in Muskegon County Jail. 38-year-old DeMarco Knox was arrested the same day in this affluent Muskegon Heights neighborhood where he lives, according to court records, and therefore faces a maximum of 47 years in prison as opposed to life. His bond is $1.5 million. Police say 43-year-old Alfonso Johnson was arrested at the corner of Columbia and Getty here in Muskegon Heights. His bond is $2 million. Johnson has a felony record that includes home invasion and drug possession, while Knox has a possession of a sawed-off shotgun conviction from more than 20 years ago, court records say. On his court paperwork, Kitchen claims he's worked for the MDOC for 16 years. At the prison, employees say he worked at the West Shoreline facility where he investigated prisoner complaints. A MDOC spokesperson says there's no reason to believe any drugs were sold at the prison, but an investigation is underway. Kitchen is now on unpaid suspension. Kitchen and Knox are also charged with felony gun possession, which could add two years to their sentence if they're convicted. They are set to return to court a week from today. In studio, Barton Dieters, 24-hour News 8. Story tonight here locally. All of these people suspected in drug dealing saw in a big bust today. Almost 30 people in custody tonight, while many others are now on the run. rtv 6s Derek Thomas showing us how this big operation to keep drugs off of our streets went down in Johnson County. Drug dealing impacts businesses and communities. Police raided room 106 here at Tierman Motel in Franklin. Under arrest is 39-year-old Charles Munns. He is charged with dealing methamphetamine, possession of a firearm by a serious violent felon, maintaining a common nuisance, and possession of a syringe. Police thoroughly searched the motel room and found the methamphetamine. Motel staffer Sam Ruthen said it was obvious possible criminal activity was going on. Uh, yesterday, maybe 15 cars going in and out. And I mean, you know, every, people are not stupid. You see that, you know, they're in there for five minutes and that's it. And they're back out and they're all running. Tenants at the motel praised the police operation. 
the fear is like some, if a weapon were to go off and someone innocent gets hurt. So that would be, or somebody were to overdose. Authorities explain their operation and what made it successful. You can see how the community is safer. There's a drug dealer who's in our jail. He's not out pushing his poison. His poison has been confiscated, is going into the Franklin evidence room. The weapons that he had on the nightstand when we went into his, to his motel room are now the property of the, of the Franklin Police Department. So guns, drugs, and drug dealers have all been removed from the street just with that one arrest. A total of 28 suspects have been arrested. These are the faces that have been peddling drugs on our streets. 15 of these suspects remain at large. Franklin Police Chief Tim O'Sullivan advises them to turn themselves in. In Franklin, Derek Thomas, RTV6. A drugged delivery. A New Hampshire woman accused of asking a friend to shoot her up with narcotics while she was in labor. Tonight, both she and that friend are facing charges. Good evening, I'm Paula Eben. And I'm Leah Martin. That baby boy is now in DCF custody. WBC's David Robichaux is live in Concord, New Hampshire tonight. Roby? Liam, the baby was born last September just outside this now shuttered home, which police call a drug den. Now, even though this happened last fall, the woman who gave birth here and their friend facing charges now because police had to wait for toxicology reports to come back. And most of the witnesses, they told us, are drug addicts who were difficult to track down. Felicia Faruja described herself to police as a chronic drug user who shot up heroin for more than half of her pregnancy. Complete disregard for really the value of human life. Felicia's friend and admitted fellow drug addict Rihanna Frenette told police that last September, Felicia went into labor inside this now condemned house in Concord. Oh, we've had a lot of drug activity there. Um, uh, seemed to be a kind of a place where there was many uh, drug addicts uh, kind of congregated. Frenette told police her pregnant friend was screaming that she couldn't take the pain of delivering a baby and begged to be shot up with heroin. So Frenette stuck a needle in her that contained either heroin or meth. When asked by police why she would do that, she replied, quote, because I'm a people pleaser. In the meantime, the soon-to-be birth mother wouldn't allow anyone to call for help. The investigations revealed that she refused to um, uh, allow anyone to call 911 until she was uh, administered or given the narcotic. Court documents show when the paramedics arrived, they found the conditions in the house so unsanitary, they were forced to carry Faruja outside and deliver the baby whose head was crowning in the ambulance. When they arrived at Concord State Hospital, the baby was immediately taken into custody by the state. A source told us that Felicia Faruja has several other children. All those kids are in state custody too. Now, the police told us that the EMTs had to administer Narcan to the birth mother when they got here because she was overdosing. Court documents show that that baby was listed as clinically stabled, uh, stable at the hospital, but the heart was beating rapidly, 100 beats per minute. The baby would be about six months old now. Now, the woman who gave birth is, fa is being held on $15,000 cash bail. The charge she's facing is called reckless conduct. That's a misdemeanor. Her friend is being held on $25,000 bail also on reckless conduct but that's a felony because she put two lives in danger her friend and the baby that's the latest live in Concord New Hampshire I'm David Robichaux WBZ a pleasant babysitter was found on the floor of a kitchen while caring for two infants Monday police say the woman 28 year old Kristen Morley had been using heroin the two children in her care were okay but this situation could have ended much differently News 2's Mason McLeod has more on how you can tell if your babysitter has an addiction problem. It's an addiction that can impact anyone. More than 90 people died of heroin overdose in the Low Country last year. Heroin addictions usually start with prescription pills. You take it a few times, and before you know it, it you want it over and over and over. And when the opioids are hard to get on the street or they get too expensive, heroin's the next best thing. According to police, Morley was the nanny for this family for about a month. Doctors say there can be signs of heroin use. Obviously, if someone is highly intoxicated on a substance such as heroin, we would see that they might be slurring their speech, they might uh, be breathing more slowly, they might begin to nod off and look more sleepy. But he says it can be difficult to tell the first time you meet someone, especially if they are not high at the time. The clues can come from trends. 
you want to see if there's an acute change in behavior or look at patterns of changes in behavior. So if someone is a babysitter and they've been good at their job and then all of a sudden maybe they start missing work or they're not able to fulfill their regular obligations at their employment, that would certainly be a cause for concern. He says the key is to check references and ask those references about any sudden changes to work ethic. They would raise concerns about caring for a child appropriately and then you might be able to figure out what's specifically going on. And then this babysitter, Kristen Morley, she was charged with possession of drug paraphernalia. Scary stuff. It most certainly is as we learn more and more people are addicted. So what is the solution to the heroin addiction problem, Macy? Well, I spoke to one nonprofit called Wake Up Carolina, and they say that big problem is highlighting the tie between the prescription drugs leading to heroin addiction and getting those prescription drugs out of your house when you're done using them to make sure they don't fall into the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. So the DEA is having a drug take back that's on April 29th. Uh, for you to bring all of those prescription drugs you may have in your home to hopefully prevent anyone in your home from becoming addicted to those and possibly becoming addicted to heroin down the road. So I'm going to post all of that information on our website, countonto.com. Those drug take-back programs are helpful. Macy, sure. thank you. Thanks. For two years, this Bayette County man's heroin connection... Being around the wrong people and just it escalated. ...ended in a Cincinnati halfway house March 1, 2015. They had to shoot me three times with Narcan. They, um, Three times? Yeah, they did um, C CPR on me twice. They said that I was purple when they found me. Doesn't uh, want his identity revealed, but as you can see, he pulls for the Buckeyes and wears his allegiance to the Reds. His loyalty no longer extends to drug enablers. Like, even if it's family members, like I said, or childhood friends, you've got to want it that bad break to away from break them. away. We spoke at the Fayette Recovery Center. I'm glad that they're trying something different. Sabrina Kersey believes the new police strategy can work. So many of them think that the only way here is if they have a court referral. This town recently had six overdose deaths in 10 days. Police aren't sure if their new method caught the attention of the several people hit with the charge so far. Police say reaction ranges from it won't work to at least you're trying something. You can't arrest your way out of it. We found that out too. Councilman Dale Lynch believes in court-ordered consequences. Otherwise, they can decide whether they want treatment or not, and most people don't want treatment. This man with the 37-year-old hands became addicted to pain meds after sinking into despair about losing custody of his daughter. Says he's living proof of the ability to find and travel. My continual road to recovery. And the head of the Hamilton County Heroin Task Force says he's aware of the approach here in Washington Courthouse and wants to hear from local prosecutors and law enforcement about whether it's worth implementing in Hamilton County. In Washington Courthouse, John London, WWT News. I picked her up to try to get her dress and she was, her lip was blue. A mother panicked and asking for help from inside a Warren housing complex. She found her eight-month-old daughter unresponsive. Tonight, that child is okay, and Warren police are investigating. Well, today, officers questioned the little girl's parents about this incident, which happened last week. 27 First News reporter and Dean Grimley spent today tracking down the latest and has our top story at 6. This scenario, an all-too-familiar scene for authorities in Warren. A child somehow ingesting opiates and overdosing. The more prevalent that uh, serious serious drugs, the presence of serious drugs become in the home, uh, the more we're going to see this kind of thing. The latest incident happened on Thursday at this residence in Warren Heights. The child's mother called 911 hysterical in need of help for her eight-month-old baby girl who had stopped breathing. Detective Nick Carney was the first on scene and performed CPR until the baby finally came to. She was taken to Trumbull Memorial and then transferred to Akron Children's Main Campus, where hospital staff found opiates in her system. Our main goal is uh, we want to figure out how an eight-month-old who cannot walk got a hold of an opiate to enough to ingest it and then to overdose. Investigators believe the child ingested an illegal narcotic but are still waiting for test results to confirm exactly what. She's since been released from the hospital and is said to be doing just fine. But this incident marks the third child in a little more than a year who's ingested some sort of opiate and overdosed in the city, prompting this plea from children's advocates. If you're using and you're not ready to quit getting high, 
um, take care of your kids. Have a family member take care of your, your children. If you don't have anyone that, you, that is trustworthy, call us. And Warren Nadine Grimley, WKBN 27 First News. Two major heroin arrests on the west side, but as Local 12's Deborah Dixon reports, it's what police found while executing search warrants that could make a huge difference. The heroin business operated in the second floor apartment of this building on West Tower Avenue, a quiet residential street minutes from the police station. He was there, it's his apartment, but I think he mainly stayed out. It was really just an office. Basically, yeah. The Marlowe Brumfield sort of heroin distribution office, according to court records, police say he was the supplier and Jamar Sims, the dealer, both faced charges as major drug offenders. The narcotics unit also confiscated $52,000, four cars worth nearly $74,000, and $5,000 in jewelry. The pound of heroin was pure. When cut, it would yield hundreds of hits. This is not uh, some lowling heroin dealer. This is a, a guy that's you know out there that's really making the big bucks on it. You know, uh, he's not out on the street. Um, he's unknown to most of us. You know, although although he does have a history. So yeah, it's a, it's a it's a it's a good arrest. Police know arrests don't stop the addiction. So West Side cops will soon be part of a quick response team. Norwood and Colerain Township already have them. After an overdose, a cop, fireman, and someone from Talbert House will knock on the door of the addict and offer help. Officer Ann Lally is a team member. If we can just get to one, I think that helps everybody around, and I think that'll get the word out that, yes, when we come knocking on your door, when there's a policeman, a fireman, a random stranger knocking on your door, that we're there to try to help you out. Well, I think it's about time we try something. Patty Hogan remembers when QRTs were talked about last summer after first responders were called to nearly 100 overdoses in one weekend. We've been hearing about these quick response teams for a while. Just do it. Just try something. The search for answers to the heroin epidemic is not going to be one thing, but arresting dealers and offering help is a good start. Deborah Dixon, Local 12 News. For a look at many of our reports in one place on the heroin epidemic around here, go to local12.com, hover, hover rather over the news tab and click on the hooked on heroin link. Now, it is a plan to chip away at heroin addiction, one user and one family at a time. Kenton County's new quick response team going to homes, hoping the families will get their loved ones to treatment. Nine on your side, Tom McKee spent the day with them. There have been 20 overdoses so far this year in Kenton County, four of them fatalities. That's why a police officer, firefighter, paramedic, and addiction counselor, the QRT team, have hit the road to try to reduce those numbers. One Thursday stop was a house where Officer Patrick Noel, paramedic Joe Rieskamp, and counselor Chris Hamilton met the mother of a girl hooked on heroin. We'll call her Katie. I went into my bathroom and found her dead and had to call the paramedic. The girl was revived that time. You stay up all night waiting for a phone call to identify your child from an overdose. Hamilton urged Katie to get her daughter into support groups. That engagement is very important, staying engaged. Okay. And I'm in recovery myself, so so I get it. So I, Come on. Oh, that's nice. It makes it easy for me to connect with people. I hope everyone listens to them and, and gets help. Counseling for the, even the parents. Yeah. It, it's a family thing. It's not just an addict thing. Then it was back on the road for a trip to the home of another suspected user. The mother said he lived elsewhere, but was glad to hear help is available for the entire family. This is not about getting, getting people in trouble. Um, this is about uh, treatment. This is about support. This is about help for uh, the, the whole community that's struggling. That's the routine the team will follow each Thursday. Home visits and offers of hope. Now we have the time to speak with the family if they're there speak with the victims if they're there. Uh, sometimes, you know, we'll speak with neighbors. Years interdiction hasn't worked. Um, arresting people hasn't worked. Incarceration doesn't work. Hopefully this treatment will work. To date, the response has been positive, just like it's been in Colerain Township, the model for the Kenton County squad. The Colerain Township team has gotten 80% of the users it's come in contact with into recovery. 
The Kenton County team hopes to meet or beat those numbers in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Tom McKee, not on your side, Kenton County. The number of people who have died from opioid overdoses has more than doubled in Wisconsin over the last decade, and overdose deaths involving heroin jumped up by nearly nine times. News 8's Madeline O'Neill has more on what the state is doing to fight this major drug problem. Martha and Mike, earlier this year, Governor Scott Walker called for a special legislative session to tackle the state's opioid epidemic. 11 bills came from that session, and now the bills are being assigned to committees. At a public hearing in Madison yesterday, a committee looked at three of those 11 bills, and local officials say they're a step in the right direction. Opioids are getting a lot of attention at the state level right now. Jen Rombolski, La Crosse County's health director, is on the governor's task force responding to the state's opioid and drug problems. Legislative changes are important and essential to really targeting and tackling the issue. One of the bills coming from the governor's legislative session would allow school workers to provide students with Narcan a life-saving drug that reverses the effects of an opioid overdose. The value of having Narcan available, as widely available as possible, to me is not a lot different than having um, uh, AEDs available. She says if the bill passes, training on administering Narcan is important. So that staff and personnel and community members can feel more comfortable with knowing what it is and how to use it. Another proposed bill would expand grant money for alternatives to jail, such as treatment court, which helps those who are addicted to drugs get help instead of putting them behind bars. Just punishing people alone doesn't really change your behavior. It just District Attorney Tim Grinke says La Crosse County has had treatment courts since the early 2000s. I think our drug court is effective. It's also expensive, but Grinke says so are probation and prison. So having treatment court as an option makes sense. What we try to do is have a system where the money we're spending is actually effective. It's changing something so they won't come back. They can start paying taxes. They can be a productive member of society. Rumbalski says there are many steps to tackling the state's opioid issues. From the individual and family level to, you know, the policy level. And the bills are one of them. And the legislation is a piece of that, a very important piece. Now, another bill looked at during yesterday's public hearing would add four state agents to the Department of Justice to help local law enforcement agencies deal with the growing heroin and meth problems. Thanks a lot, Madeline. Also, on the national level, some legislators are introducing what's called the Lifeboat Act, which would set up funding to expand access to substance abuse treatment options. 